Ho tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hare mai, ho Sophie Sparrow toko inoa, ko nga moana whakauka, aho e mahiana, he kai tohu tohu aho. Hello everybody, thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Sophie Sparrow, I'm a communications advisor with the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, and I'll be your facilitator today. Now please feel free to jump in the chat and introduce yourself, where you're from, what you do, so that people can get an idea of who else are here. And very soon, we will get started. Uh, so the Restorative Marine Economies Project aims to develop knowledge and decision, decision support tools, such as impact investment frameworks and models, to enable economic mechanisms for the restoration of coastal and marine environments. Our researchers have conducted interviews with sustainable finance and investment specialists, carbon market experts, banks, risk management and insurance modelers, and iwi trusts. Questions about the opportunities and challenges facing restorative economies were focused on awareness of the blue economy, drivers for investment, revenue sources and establishing restoration as a mainstream asset class. Your speakers today are Chirisela Stanku, Sustainability Director at Envirostrat, and Jason Mika, Associate Professor at the University of Waikato. Chirisela is part of the research team for the Restorative Marine Economies Project. Uh, she works with private sector and government organizations on sustainability solutions and integration of natural capital and ecosystem services in policy and business decisions, including performance, measurement, and disclosure. Jason Mika is part of the research team for the Restorative Marine Economies Project as well, uh, along with being co-leader of the Indigenizing the Blue Economy Project. Jason's research, teaching, writing, and practice all centers on indigenous business philosophy in multiple sites, sectors, and scales, including indigenous trade, tourism, agribusiness, and the marine economy. Now, before I hand over to our speakers, just some quick housekeeping about the session. Uh, the presentation will run for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have some time for a question and answer session. So you can submit your questions using the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can submit questions at any time during the webinar and we'll get to them at the end. I will read out the questions to our presenters so that everybody can hear them. All right, over to you, Chirisela. Thank you, Sophie and uh, Kiora, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today. I uh, really appreciate that. My name is Sharethala Tanku, and as Sophie mentioned, uh, I'm with um, Envirostrat. We are a, a natural resource advisory and project development company uh, working in New Zealand and outside of New Zealand as well, and involved with the um, co-leading this project together with NIWA um, around encouraging restorative economies in New Zealand um, marine environment, marine spaces. Um, and of course, working, collaborating with Jason um, around Maori values and how this influences the, the, uh, the work, the um, entrepreneurship in the sector, the way we are actually seeking uh, solutions. So um, just a little bit um, about the uh, project. Um, we've Part of the research we've been doing is really try to get at the core of what restorative marine economies means as well, um, and how, in fact, restoration really functions in this wider spectrum, if you want, of what blue economy is about. Um, and it's been interesting to us because we all have views around, you know, there is so much terminology these days around circular economy and blue economy and green economy and so on. So we try to really position, if you want, restoration within this uh, spectrum of shifting uh, greening practices uh, around industry and the finance as well. And with our research project, um, and I really don't know how to do a highlight for the, for the slide that you're looking at, with our research project, we really focused a lot uh, of what we call the pinnacle of blue economy spectrum, which is at the top around restorative economies. 
Um, the way we distinguish this to the, uh, if you want, evolving spectrum of uh, blue economy, which means how do we actually do economy differently in a way that we minimize impact and externalities, is actually going even further than that to say, how do we do economy in a way that we actively invest um, in uh, natural capital restoration, we actively invest in bringing back some of the assets that we either lost altogether or we've degraded uh, to an extent that now they require active investment to get back to where they used to be, especially around uh, natural capital. Um, now, articulating further why we're looking at the investment angle um, and the role of investment in conservation, this is a, a diagram that gives you a bit of a high level, if you want, understanding of where conservation finance in New Zealand is at. Um, and the easiest way to describe it, recognizing that some of the data, we don't know precisely, for example, how much private sector really contributes. Um, and with these numbers, there, is, there are estimates. But overall, what we can actually say is that by and large, we are looking at possibly government um, and you know, generally taxpayers' money, if you want, contributing to somewhere around 90% of what we see uh, as, as being spent in conservation, especially in relation to what we call the conservation estate in New Zealand, which is about a third of the country. Um, with our research, we're also asking and trying to seek answers to, hey, if we are looking at private investments and uh, private finance into conservation, how can we get there? You know, Do we know, for example, how large is the conservation gap and so on? So there are all sorts of, if you want, um, explorations that we need to do, but our research focus was really around understanding better how can we bring uh, private capital um, and non-government, non-public capital into the conservation um, and natural capital protection arena. So to do that, what we've done is to interview a wide range of actors in the what we call the the value uh, uh, the value chain for finance. So we talk to uh, large uh, institutions like New Zealand Super Fund, New Zealand Green Investment Fund, but we also talk to um, players and organizations that are at the other end of the, they need the finance to cover some of their solutions and so on. We also talk to um, experts in, in the finance space that are actually much more in the observe and, and analytical stage to really understand, you know, how responsible are our investments, how green they are and so on. So we've gathered a broad range of uh, investor perspective. Um, and we ended up with what you see here, pretty uh, complex, um, I don't know, spider web, uh, let's call it, where we tried, um, you know, out of these 12 interviews and more that we've recorded, transcribed, analyzed, and so on, we put together what we what we heard as key themes, you know, what were the, the sort of topics and issues that were raised consistently through the uh, many interviews uh, that we've done. And Jason will cover as well uh, Maori perspective on some of those. And you can see actually how large the synergy is. So what we've heard in terms of the big, um, if you want the big picture uh, side of, the, um, of things, it really is, uh, you know, there are some key themes, one of which is around the need for scale. So if you're looking at attracting capital from, uh, for example, organizations like New Zealand Super Fund, they invest in solutions and projects that are large in scale. Um, and this is also something that was raised often by uh, the investors we talked to around, you know, what is the scale up vision? You know, maybe you might start smaller, but is there a potential, you know, that you can replicate and achieve a much larger scale? So that's that's one thing that is also linked to the long term vision. Um, the other one is around how do we activate um, and capture new revenues? And that's where, you know, for those of us that work in the environmental management and environmental natural resource side of things, that's where we uh, there is this interface with payment for ecosystem services, but also the role of environmental markets, of which in New Zealand we are most familiar with carbon market. Um, another theme was around the risk uh, and return profile. There are many great ideas around conservation and restoration, both by community groups, restoration groups, but also businesses that operate uh, in primary sector and they're seeking solutions. It's a matter of how this risk and return profiles and so um, uh, are defined. And we know that's not an easy uh, topic. 
Um, I'm just going to drill very briefly on a few topics of these large uh, themes that we've heard investors talking about. And I'll start with this, um, what we call this balance between uh, the impact that uh, is being uh, thought um, in terms of uh, investment versus the risk perception around some of the investments, especially when we talk about uh, investment in ecosystem restoration, which is not a traditional uh, should we say, uh, area of investment, especially for commercial uh, investors, and also the returns ex expectations and returns specifically, we're talking about, you know, financial returns, uh, because we know that there has to be a balance uh, between these. What we've, um, what we've heard quite a bit from investors was the fact that, you know, um, though all of them expressed uh, a commitment and interest in delivering impact be, uh, beyond return on uh, on finance. They are, of course, um, um, they are of course limited, or they have to follow fiduciary duties. No matter what investments and what drives that investment, they still have to ensure that they don't lose capital. And you know, ideally, they also have a return in, ca in capital. We see a tension, you know, landing a good balance between returns, the risk that some of the ecosystem restoration projects uh, pose because there is still a lot of learning in that space and the impact achieved, um, you know, it's a space that it's challenging uh, for our area of work. And, you know, the timeline is important as well. Investors don't look necessarily at 10, 20 years, which tends to be, um, you know, normal ecosystem restoration uh, turnaround times, if you want, when we can actually say, yes, we can see that the ecosystem has recovered. Those are very long timelines for um, regular investors. So there is a bit of an alignment, if you want, that will have to happen there. Um, I mentioned also that, you know, this idea of um, scale, both in terms of, uh, you know, deployment of capital and the impact achieved was raised as well. Um, and, you know, from a biophysical, if you want, ecosystem perspective, we do have an answer to this scale question, which is majority of our thinking analysis around environmental performance, degradation of natural capital and so on often happens at ecosystem scale um, and in our case, seascape uh, scale. So this is a way, um, if you want, where, you know, when we do thinking at that level, we can bring together for investors and also restoration groups, the uh, wide range of drivers, if you want, and, and knowledge. Uh, we have the knowledge around natural capital and ecosystem services. We have the, the markets that operate at these large scales. Um, and with that comes, you know, verification and so on, the, the rigor that is required uh, when investments are being made. And of course, the influence that we have from finance and investment. And I think, you know, this pictorial that you see there, um, it's, um, we're trying to get inspired a little bit by Haraki Golf, but what it says is that when we do this level of seascape, uh, seascape level assessment, we have, if you want, uh, a wide range of portfolio of investments with a variety of solutions that can um, that happen at an ecosystem seascape level with different risk, um, different if you want risk and impact profile, but in aggregate they can generate that scale that often investors uh, are talking about. Moving on now to another theme that was um, you know raised a lot in all of the interviews that we've uh, had. Uh, irrespective if we were talking with uh, commercial investors or EU investors and so on, was this idea that we, we have to understand really the revenue models and the revenue streams behind any investment. That's a fundamental dimension uh, in, in investment. And of course, when we think about the marine sector, we have what we call traditional revenue um, uh, uh, streams of sectors that operate um, in the marine economy and blue economy more broadly. What we focused on more and tried to tease out, if you want more through uh, with our interviews, was this idea of actually how can we activate new revenue streams that recognize the fact that um, natural assets have intrinsic value, but they're also a key underpinning foundation, if you want, of economic activity. And so, you know, we've we've had quite interesting conversations and insights that we captured through the research around, you know, topics, for example, uh, around environmental markets. Uh, where is blue carbon in the case of marine economy and biodiversity credits? You know, can can this, uh, these tools, if you want, uh, and platforms, can they be 
uh, enabling new revenue generation. Likewise, in terms of transition to sustainable fishing, but also what we see new opportunities in aquaculture sector where we're looking talking about regenerative agriculture, uh, aquaculture, about, uh, you know, having new uh, payment schemes that can happen, new premiums and so on, as a result of this high value, um, if you want, um, means of using um, the natural environment and marine environment. And then, of course, you know, um, in, in our particular case in, in New Zealand, but also elsewhere, it's around, you know, uh, the, the revenue streams that come from tourism. Um, and the importance of marine protected areas and the interface and the value they generate to communities and economic sectors as well. Um, and you can see that this is, you know, overall there is this um, um, insight that we need some level of monetization. We need to be able to use more economic instruments to be really to enable the flow of capital into restoration projects. Uh, how we do that and the, the level of integrity and measures and metrics that we put, that still, you know, in often case has to be explored further, but there is a, a necessity of doing all of that. So overall, when we look back at everything that we've heard from investors, um, you know, what's very clear is that, you know, valuation and monetization will play a role, value of natural capital as well, um, and how we uh, capture that in our, uh, you know, system of accounts, in, in the system of accounts of businesses and sectors and so on. Um, and also level, how we enhance the level of certainty for investors to, to reduce the risk and make more appealing uh, restoration as an investable activity. We don't have fully the answers to that, but we do know that there are, um, you know, based on what we've heard and the analysis we've done is that uh, government will play a role um, indicating greater willingness to pay for some of the services. Recognize the uh, lounge door. Operating into a um, an environment in marine space where a lot of the goods are public goods. Um, that government will play a role, uh, role, but it's also around, you know, what is it that we, uh, what tools and knowledge we develop in ecosystem management and measurement so that we make easy investment in this place. Ultimately, um, and I think, you know, that was the bigger picture, if you want, um, take away for the research team was this idea that when we talk about investment in restoration, we're talking about bringing together two distinct, if you want, groups to date. One is the investment community group um, that have established way of, you know, uh, placing capital and so on. And the other one is really what we call the, those, the supply side, those that actually will develop the pipeline of opportunities that are, you know, that are working on the ground around restoration, the businesses that are doing the transition in terms of uh, their performance and so on. And so these are communities that you know, even language, terminology, and so on, it's not yet quite there. So there is a lot of alignment that needs to happen and a lot of new thinking around, you know, how do we work in blended finance context? Uh, what type of governance, if we're talking about scale and if we're talking about investment in ecosystems, what type of governance do we have at an ecosystem level? We know about governance at organizational levels and so on, but ecosystems, how can we enable that? It's also about actually restoration and environmental community where the majority of expertise in conservation lies about actually taking on knowledge around, you know, financial literacy, uh, being much more entrepreneurial, focusing on commercial viability of some of the restoration uh, uh, solution. So it is really about bringing together different mindsets um, and actually learning really and educating and growing that awareness uh, jointly as distinct groups that are now uh, working together. I think that's really a, a quick rush through of everything we've learned. And now passing over to Jason to talk about the insights uh, he uh, he had from his part of the research. Thank you, Kiara. Kia ora, Chirisella. Uh, kia ora, Tato. Uh, tu tahi ka mihi atu hau kia kia Tato itelangi nei. Uh, Nā mana ki tana o te runga rawa ki kiri kia Tato katoa. Uh, ko ai te nei mihi atu nei kia Tato ko mā Tato te waka ko tāki tumi te waka. Uh, ko Jason Mika Ahau, 
kai te raupapa, kai te whare wānanga o Waikato a haue mahiana, kai kirikiri roa a haue noho ana me te whānau. Nō reira, ka nui te mi ki a tātou i runga i te wānei, ko te kirihimete. Kia ora everyone, kia ora Cherisella, kia ora Sophie, kia ora Marianne and Nick, Conrad and everyone else who's joining in today. It's just wonderful to uh, to to be here, uh, we've got people from Canada and, and UK, which is which is pretty awesome. I don't know what it time what time it is over there, but I'm sure it's pretty late. So great to have you. Um, so uh, I was really pleased to be invited uh, to join uh, Cherisella and the team uh, and to contribute to this this research for a couple of reasons. First is because I'm really interested in access to finance for Māori enterprise in particular mostly in terms of land-based uh, economies, but also in terms of marine economies and the Māori marine economy in particular. So I guess uh, my uh, part, I'm just going to talk about some of the, the findings, the learnings that we, uh, we found when talking with Māori who have an interest in investment uh, and finance and enterprise uh, in marine uh, environments. Next slide, please. So my perspective on, on this is to approach it from the, the, the perspective of the Māori marine economy. We see marine economies, restorative marine economies in our own particular ways. And this is one way of seeing the marine economy uh, from a Māori perspective. And this diagram here, you don't have to sort of study it because the detail is in a, is in a report on the Challenges website. Uh, which, which Sophie can provide the information for, but it, it talks about what is a Māori marine economy. And for us, it's, it's whai rawa, whai mana, whai oranga. It's the pursuit of well-being. Uh, it's the pursuit of uh, resources and capabilities, but it's also the pursuit of, I guess, enhancing the mana of one another through our engagement with tangaroa, uh, the moana. And this diagram here talks about the complexity uh, when we think about marine economies and Māori marine economies in particular, uh, and we think about engagement uh, through customary fisheries, commercial fisheries, we can sort of see this haze of legislation of uh, judicial crown entities of local regional government organisations, and also people who are trying to look after the moana, the kaitiaki. Uh, at coastal communities up and down the country, but also our, our commercial and, and recreational fishers as well, what they have to contend with in order to conduct their activity, but also to contribute to restoration of these marine economies. So they have to negotiate this, this web of institutional frameworks. So financing in this environment becomes uh, immensely complicated, but it's possible. Next slide, please, Eho. So uh, in terms of engaging with Māori who are involved in finance, uh, investment and enterprise in, in, in the Māori economy, Māori marine economy, uh, what, we, what we wanted to know is really how to enable investment in restoring marine economies. What would be the triggers? What would encourage and incentivize uh, organizations and communities to be able to do this? And we also wanted to know, well, what are the Māori approaches and the principles and the practices uh, that Māori use to invest, but also in particular invest in uh, restorative marine economies? So we wanted to talk to these uh, Māori enterprises or institutions who have that kind of perspective. And we interviewed a small group of people, only about six, six people. So what did we do? Well, we... we we talked to, we had a cordial uh, with five people and, and one person was kind enough to provide some written comments to our, our questions. Uh, we analyzed this information. We discussed what we found as a group and, and kind of um, asked three main questions. You know, we, we're sort of talking about a Kaupapa Māori methodology here. We want to know about the people. Who are we actually talking to, uh, which has to do with identity uh, and investing? What is their role in investing? and looking after other people's money, other people's resources, and how do they actually do that? What are the things that they're investing in and, and to make that possible? So who do we talk to? Here are the kind of 
this is the profile. I'm not going to tell you tell you who they were, but they were they were real people, and uh, it was great to have a cordial with them. Uh, so there was a person who was a kind of a sustainability director in a in a Māori fishing company. Uh, there was a consultant who was sort of trained as an economist, but works closely with iwi and Māori organisations uh, and uh, oversees investment portfolios for large scale Māori collective investments as well as iwi investments. We had uh, some advice and comments from a CFO of a of a uh, fishing company, Māori fishing company, uh, who gave his his views. Uh, we also had uh, we talked to three people that sort of are closely aligned with uh, iwi and Māori investments. Uh, one was a tribal investor uh, and a tribal advisor uh, who who was working with their their tribe around post settlement governance and the commercial arm of that post-settlement governance entity to basically gear it up uh, to do what it needs to do. Uh, another person that we spoke to was a fund manager, a Māori fund manager who's using Māori values and principles uh, to guide the assessment of mainstream companies using Māori values, very innovative. Uh, and then a tribal governor, so someone who was a trained accountant, worked in banking and finance for for many years, but also is really focused now on sort of administering and growing tribal assets. So what did we find? Well, we found a few things. One side, we talked about, you know, what are the sort of Māori approaches to investing? The other side is really concerned with uh, investing in restorative economies and what that might look like for from a Māori perspective. So some of the things around, I guess, uh, in, you know, approaches to investing. So We've got, uh, what we found is that uh, post-settlement governance entities are starting to do business with Māori authorities from the same tribes. Uh, so these are land-owning entities, and you've, so you've got a mixture of post-settlement governance assets and Māori authority assets, which are primarily land-based, wanting to do business together for the benefit of the tribe in both marine and terrestrial-based uh, uh, economic activity. Uh, one of the other approaches is uh, Māori and Pākehā co-investing in uh, marine uh, uh, sort of enterprises, Māori marine-based enterprises in aquaculture in particular, but also in other areas. So there's collaboration within the market uh, across Māori and non-Māori. Assessing risk using Māori values. Now, this was basically using Māori values as a way to kind of assess or filter what looks like a good investment uh, for uh, investors in this particular fund. So it's kind of like a, a Māori version of ESG, but it's better. You know, so, um, you know, because it uses Māori values as, a, as the basis, not as an add-on, as the basis for assessing risk and opportunity. Uh, both commercial, social, or let's say commercial, social and environmental returns expected. From a Māori point of view, they uh, really, especially tribal organizations, really rely on the economic returns to run the business. And so it's important that uh, there are economic returns, but they also have to be environmental and social returns uh, as well. Uh, so unlike the philanthropists uh, over in the US who might be okay to invest their, 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 their resources without a commercial expectation of commercial return, uh, Māori uh, do require that commercial return. Uh, leveraging com collective assets for individual gain. Post-settlement treaty assets uh, are being used to enable whānau uh, to, uh, to, to develop wealth for themselves, personal and collective and household and whānau wealth. Uh, so that is also starting to be a source of, I guess, wealth creation at that sort of level. Then also businesses are about relationship about people. Uh, and so when we talk about investing in restorative economies, um, you know, and marine economies, we're actually talking about people. It's the people that are going to do the mahi, uh, get the work done in those spaces and are doing them. A lot of you people here right now, uh, those, you know, you guys are the ones that are getting this, this stuff done. Uh, investing in restorative economies, Māori worldview and water. So we all have a relationship with water. Uh, so, what is a Māori philosophy of water? Uh, and one of the one of the uh, interviewees raised the point of, well, 
what is to you know what is the blue economy is it salt water is it fresh water or is it both and to this person it was both doesn't end at the and start at the sea it's you know uh, it's from uh, from the moment to the sea uh, you know so um different perspectives there uh, and then also a, a big focus on active rather than passive investing so uh, in order for Māori values Māori thinking and Māori aspirations to influence the way in which their financial resources are managed administered and where that goes um, you know Māori aspire to basically be the the managers of those funds rather than outsourcing it to third-party fund managers and investment houses and so forth in order for that uh, that influence to be present mm -hmm. building capability of Māori to invest to to be part of that finance community uh, was an, also a, a key finding building institutional capability of the banks of investment uh, firms and uh, and also government institutions to really um, understand that that Māori worldview and approach and expectations adding indigenous values incorporating those indigenous values to how investment occurs and what we invest in so lots more there Next one. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means a couple of things. One, if we're going to develop kind of investment frameworks, policies, tools, guidance, uh, then we need to introduce uh, some, some uh, I guess, Māori philosophies and practices around investing and around restorative economies. Relationality, our relationship with Tangaro, with Hinemoana, with coastal communities uh, needs to be recognised that hey, look, it's not just the moana, that's our tipuna there, that's our ancestor. And we have an obligation, a reciprocal obligation to, to look, after, uh, look after her uh, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. Capability building was a big one for Māori and for Pākehā about Māori values, knowledge and, uh, and in these coastal communities for the well-being of all. Adapting investment frameworks of Māori values was also important balancing commercial and environmental returns. So it's not just one or the other, we've got to, got to do things, you know, have that together. But also uh, where there's opportunities for Māori to co-invest, to be partners in restorative economies and the investment that goes in it, uh, you know, that's kind of probably uh, where the preference might be. Gilda. That's me, yeah, what? So, uh, Kia ora. Thank you, Chair Sala and Jason, for sharing that overview of your mahi. Uh, if you do have questions, please pop them in the Q&A box uh, that's just along the bottom of your screen. Uh, we have had a couple come through, so I will get that underway. Uh, our first question is from Kath Wallace. Uh, natural capital as systems are not well conceived as something that can be monetized. The big issue is to prevent further deterioration and depletion. That needs mm. institutions to protect and regulate. The QMS in NZ has done some good, but has given enormous political power to depleters. Don't we need to recognise the power relationships too? I think, J Jason, since you had a slide finishing with that, do you want to reflect on this? Sure, sure. Um, I totally agree with that. You know, we have to account for the power relationships and who calls the shots on this stuff and who decides for us and how. Um, and uh, within the challenge itself, within the, uh, you know, Namuana uh, Fakauka, the Sustainable uh, Seas Challenge, um, there is some work going on to figure that out, you know, in relation to this idea of ecosystem based management. Uh, for for the marine economy, for the marine environment, and uh, part of that is is kind of trying to include everyone who you know ought to have a say. But you're right; those power dynamics are important to establish. One of them is uh, there's some research around Tetiriti or Waitangi, and uh, just to try to provide some clarity as to the roles, the relationships, the rights, the responsibilities of Maori and the Crown in relation to each other over. Uh, you know, our relationship with the moana. And it's not just for Māori, you know, that that work is being done. It's for all of us to sort of have that clarity as to what might be a partnership-based uh, way of figuring out 
um, you know, what's important, what are the values and the practices and the changes that need to be made to economic practice in 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 the moana. So lots to lots to lots of work to be done there. And I think the challenge mm -hmm. has a contribution to make. And, and thank you, Jason. Just quickly just to quickly add why we recognize this, and it, it really is a very good point. It's also that when we think about, you know, the, the fact that we look after ecosystems at, at scale, um, then recognizing the relations and the variety of perspectives, interest groups that are active and, and powers at play is important uh, as means to also give rise to the appropriate governance models. And if we think about the investment side of things, what investors often seek is also clarity around governance because that's part of what reduces their own investment risks. And so the, there are interesting dimensions and factors here to be analyzed and recognized in terms of the connection between you know, relations, values, uh, the, the models of governance they gave rise to, and as a result, also reducing risk and uncertainty uh, for outcomes. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got another question from Kath Wallace. Kia ora, Kath. Uh, one of the interesting observations that Shane Jones made in the 1991 ECO Sea Views Conference was that under the ITQ system in NZ, Māori were cast just as quota owners and not in any management role that drove attempts to increase the number of species in the QMS, but not the ecosystem approach or other kaitiaki approaches. Is this still true? Wow. I missed <laughs> that conference. You go, you go, Chirisella. Um, I mean, of course, I think, Jason, you, you're better placed to, to, to answer this first because it represents, you know, perspective of a, a certain group. Um, but I, I mean, you know, an answer would be, I hope not. I hope that things have changed. Um, but over, over yeah. to you, Jason. I, 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 it's difficult to speak on behalf of a group um, that I don't represent. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess the the answer is in that picture that I put up um, the, about what the what the institutional framework for the Māori marine economy looks like. And, and on that slide, it it shows you the the complicated mosaic that we have to live with and contend with. Um, it's kind of it's kind of um, done a couple of things. One is sort of it's kind of uh, guided as to, you know, separated out commercial and customary uh, fisheries, whereas in a Māori worldview, prior to, prior to you know, uh, you know, customary and commercial is, is just one and the same thing. Feeding whānau uh, through uh, customary means was, was, was paramount. And um, so I think uh, we have to sort of work in with that framework. Um, and... I think in terms of uh, kaitiaki responsibilities and being able to meet those, that is that is still something we're, we're kind of uh, working through in that sort of institutional environment. So still, still a lot of work to be done there. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Nick Lewis. Uh, I wonder whether both might comment in general terms on the knowledge gaps, especially ecological, that need to be closed, secure investment in a restorative economy. I, I go, think, yeah. I mean, that there are definitely, um, if I can, uh, Jason, I'll, I'll go quickly on this one. Yeah. There are definitely um, knowledge gaps uh, that we have in terms of really the science behind some of the solutions. So for example, when, when we think about restoration of mussel reefs in Hauraki Gulf, we know that we are still, um, you know, the, the science is still out there and there is high level of uncertainty around, you know, can we recover um, these habitats? You know, what's going to, to take and so on. So that's on the biophysical side. And, and importantly as well is how do we stack benefits? So if you think about making uh, restoration 
attractive is also about demonstrating the wide range of benefits that restoration of uh, marine environment actually provides. And I believe that there is still a while to go in a way that we can, in a standardized uh, manner, express benefits and have metrics that are easily understood and so on, or that these metrics have actually transitioned into an investment decision-making environment. Uh, on the other hand, we also have knowledge that connects the cost of restoration and the economics of it uh, with the outcomes of restoration, right? So we tend to develop knowledge in silos. So we have biophysical knowledge, we have economics, uh, then we have governance models as well. But in terms of bringing all of that together to support um, you know, some of the natural capital accounting that we've heard quite a bit being raised as a topic and how we integrate that in business decision-making and investment decisions. Again, this represents gaps that also offer opportunities for, for science community and research community, but also for the business sectors. Hilda, Nick, thank you for the question. I think the one thing I will say is that, the, yes, there are knowledge gaps, but as, as Chirisella mentioned that you know we there's a lot we we're starting to learn now and I think if if um, if participants uh, take a look at the um, sustainable seas website there's a plethora of um, research uh, in in sort of a whole range of areas and in fact you could probably you know get a couple of PhDs out of just reading that stuff and sort of writing it up uh, and um, I, I guess for for me, there's there are gaps in knowledge about um, I guess at the firm level as to how do you translate the science, the economics, the the the, the sort of marine governance, the marine management, the ecosystem elements. How do you translate that for a firm that that is trying to sort of uh, be uh, sort of do things in terms of a customary uh, practice that is appropriate. Uh, for the moana, for na tangata ireira, uh, but also in terms of the commercial elements as well. So there, there's a there's a lot that needs to be done around the taking of all the science, the economics, and the, what we do know, and turning that into something really practical and meaningful for uh, our enterprises who are who are in, in these uh, marine economies. So there's there's a knowledge gap there, but there's also uh, knowledge gaps as we found in this research around capability. So understanding Māori knowledge, Māori values, and how they apply to investment approaches, both in the marine sort of environment, but also in, in sort of the relationship between Finwe and the moana. There's some examples where that's happening, you know, and that, that capability is growing. Uh, and there's some really exciting projects, particularly in terms of uh, sea farming uh, out at the, uh, uh, you know, out in the Bay of Plenty there and other places. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get out of my uh, sharing device, finally. Here <laughs> so we go. <laughs> All right, uh, we've got an, oh, Nick just says really helpful, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Robert Hickson. Do your findings apply equally to the creation of new marine ecological systems or habitats as might be achieved through large scale seaweed aquaculture. Mm. Sophie, sorry, can you repeat that again? Oh. Just... Do your findings apply equally to creation of new marine ecological systems or habitats as might be achieved through large scale seaweed aquaculture? I, taking a stab, we would say perhaps yes. Whether do they apply in totality? Most likely not. Um, but what's been interesting as a, if you want, conceptual exercise was this idea of looking at the wide range of restoration opportunities and activities that can happen within a large ecosystem and how they in aggregate um, not only present the, the scale that investors ask for, but it's also about their aggregation in relation to um, ecosystem restoration aspirations at scale. Um, so, I, so I would say it's not one or the other. Um, and perhaps with our findings, you know, there are snippets of, um, of that are material 
and relevant uh, for both uh, the sides of the question. I agree. It's relevant uh, because, I mean, we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, the way in which investment flows to these sort of restorative marine economies and the ecological systems in which they're based is important. Uh, and that that, uh, that provider, that capital provider and the capital seeker sort of relationship needs to be worked out in that context. Uh, so certainly, it, 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 you know, the findings do have relevance. The question the, the challenge it really is a sort of translation exercise that has to happen uh, between the findings and those specific uh, uh, projects that you, you might be referring to there. Wonderful. We've got time for maybe a couple more questions. Uh, I've got one here from Zoe Chu. Uh, thank you for the great talks. I am just wondering about addressing climate change related physical risks. For example, ecosystems for reducing flood and coastal erosion. Do we have some existing frameworks in terms of risk assessment? I'm not sure that's a question that I could answer. We, we might need our colleagues from the rest of the challenge to, to have a crack at that one. Sure, we can pass that yeah. one on to the team and hopefully get yeah, an answers through to you, Zoe. Correct, Sophie, but, but I would say that, um, you know, we, we talked about why there is such high level of complexity um, and, you know, um, but also this need of bringing different groups together. Perhaps what I would add to all of that is that there is also a level of urgency to what, you know, to, to bringing solutions about. Um, and that urgency is not simply informed by the fact that we have a dependency on these ecosystems and we've degraded them and now we have to walk back some of that degradation. But it is really because we are faced with the reality of climate change that adds, you know, that in some ways speeds up the cycle of impact that we're trying to, to reverse. Um, so, you know, it, it adds further complexity and often we would also say we use that as a way of, we turn, you know, climate change in a driver to actually inform uh, and speed up um, actions and solutions. I mean, just to add to that, I think um, one, of the, one of the challenges for the challenge is actually to, to work across challenges. Um, mm -hmm. At the moment, we're sort of carved up and sort of says, well, sustainable seas is one challenge, our land and water is another. And yet the relationship between the whenua and the moana, as you say, you know, in terms of uh, coastal environments and flood protection and climate impacts at that kind of interface between land and water uh, really needs to be uh, figured out. And so that there is alignment between what happens on the whenua and what, you know, ends up in our, in our uh, moana. Kia ora, Zoe says thank you for that. Uh, I've got one more question just to finish off with. Were there any examples highlighted by interviewees of initiatives that they would like to invest in? I mean, it's, it's probably one that's already sort of been invested in it, and it's the, um, it's the Whakatoya mussel farms out in the sort of Bay of Plenty area. Um, that you know is, is sort of has been a long-term project for Fakatoa here, and and all of the sort of enterprises that have invested and in, in made that sort of that enterprise possible and growing. Um, it's it's now going to sort of benefit from having a a, a port established so that um, you know that they've got uh, land-based production can occur in the Fakatoa here uh, at all here. Uh, and then you've also just recently, we've also just recently had the Whakatohia Treaty Settlement uh, resolved. Uh, so there's potential to expand that uh, that uh, sort of marine-based economy around uh, the sea-based mussel farm of, of Whakatohia. Um, the financing for that project is, you know, has been it's it was it was difficult, uh, but the you know they got there, and so there's potential for expansion of those sort of sea spaces uh, using that sort of that mm. uh, that area. And and perhaps I would um, I would add beyond this field of what we call um, 
you know, uh, sustainable management, it's it's uh, muscle farming and so on, all of these areas where there are existing value chains. Um, and we would normally qualify them in some ways under the spectrum of what we call commodities, which is not fully um, um, maybe uh, correct. But beyond that, one of the things that came in the interviews we've, we've had and, you know, questions and curiosity, if you want, from, um, from investors was around some of the natural asset driven investment. So, you know, we've had conversations linked to blue carbon, for example, in relation to uh, intertidal wetlands. Many of us, you know, traveling around New Zealand and working out uh, on the coast and so on, we understand that that interface. So there was interest and there were inquiries. Now, do we have tangible at scale uh, projects already happening? We do have restoration projects. Um, there is still that bridge to to be uh, to be filled um, and taking this, some of these ideas and really turning them into an investment opportunity. But uh, environmental markets, biodiversity was a theme, uh, I would say, in terms of uh, new ideas uh, for for investment. Oh, kia ora. We are over time now, so I will wrap us up. Uh, thank you, Chirisella and Jason, for sharing your insights. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming along. Uh, we'll be sending out a recording of this uh, webinar and any other resources uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, otherwise, everybody, have a lovely day. Thank you for coming. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you.